Let's turn to 1 John. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to need, oh, there it is. Um, imagine you're an elderly apostle. I try to imagine that. Some people, it's not hard for them to imagine. Most of us, it is. You're an elderly apostle. You have so many memories. You have so many stories to tell. There's so much in your head, in your heart about Jesus. You're the guy that everybody else is saying, he's the one he loves. And all the other apostles, so far as you know, they're dead. You're the only one left. You're an elder of the church where you are. And there are probably a number of small churches around that look to you for wisdom, for guidance, for strength, for encouragement. And over time you've become aware that in some of these churches there are people who, who have infiltrated the churches and they're teaching things about Jesus that are just not true. I think you'd be very disturbed. I think you'd be heartbroken. I think that you would have some worry and fear that you would be very concerned about the souls of people and, and especially when you're hearing that there are people in some of these churches that are listening to these false teachers and following these false teachers and maybe even to the point that some of these churches have even broken fellowship with you and some of the other churches that have been faithful that's the backdrop of these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's what's been going on. And that's why John is writing. He's writing to these churches because they need to hear from him. They need assurance. They need confirmation. They need to know that they're doing the right thing by not following these false teachers, these false apostles, these people that are teaching these things, uh, uh, really a false gospel. And so the message that John is trying to get across to these people is that truth matters. It matters what we believe. And it matters how we live our lives. Because these people who were doing the false teaching, they were saying things about Jesus, questioning that he was a man, that he came in the flesh, questioning who he was and questioning his purpose for being here. In fact, it had gotten to the point where they believed that they had received a supernatural knowledge, a knowledge from God that God didn't share with other people. They were the elite. They were special because God had let them in on a secret, so to speak, and nobody else knew about it. And so they were going to be the ambassadors. They were going to be the ones to tell this new story. They were going to be the ones to tell the truth about Jesus. He had not come in the flesh. So you can see why John would be so disturbed. And it seems as if their lifestyle was such, and we'll explain this momentarily, their lifestyle was such that it didn't matter how you treat people. It didn't matter what Jesus said. You didn't have to obey him. You didn't have to live like Jesus. 
And so John is writing to them and letting them know it does matter how we live. It matters. It's important what you believe. And it's important how you live your life. You see, the person and the purpose of Jesus was being questioned. And this was probably an early seed of Gnosticism. And whether or not you've ever heard of Gnosticism doesn't matter. It probably was not full-blown. It hadn't fully developed at this time. But this was the beginning of it. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which simply means knowledge. And like I said, they were claiming a higher, a superior knowledge. Those of us that have been studying 2 Corinthians in our grow groups, remember the super apostles? You know, the Corinthians were dealing with a very similar kind of thing. They were dealing with a group of elite people who were, had a, a, a knowledge that they didn't have, supposedly. And they were trying to set the Corinthians straight because they knew better. And they were very arrogant about this knowledge that they possessed. And you know, knowledge does that sometimes. We've all seen the correlation between knowledge and arrogance, knowledge and pride. Sadly, it's in a lot of churches. People think sometimes, and lots of people in lots of places, are prone to think that I know better. I understand the Bible and you don't. If you don't agree with me, then you don't understand. I have a knowledge. This is from the Lord has enlightened me. The Lord has shown me. I've got the truth. And man, you can see where that can go and you can see the problems that that can cause and you can see the division. You can see, oh, that's not of the Spirit. That's not of God. And these kind of people were attacking the church. What they believed really had to do with Greek philosophy, with Plato. You know, the idea was simply everything tangible, physical, all matter is bad. It's evil. And the spirit is good. And so as they thought all of this through and processed it, and they came to believe that they lived in the Spirit, and their bodies didn't matter. And so sin was irrelevant. It was unimportant. It didn't matter because I'm not living in my body anyway. The only thing that matters is my spirit, and so it doesn't matter what I do with my body. Now, I know that sounds weird, that's strange, but that's what they believed. And knowing all of this is really important as we go through 1 John, because so much of what we're going to read in 1 John directly addresses these things. For for example, when we get to 1 John chapter 2, it begins by saying, if we say we have no sin, or at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. He tells them don't sin, but then if anyone does sin, and so he talks about the reality of sin. Then in chapter 3, he talks about the one who lives a life of sin, and they're a child of the devil. And so we read all of this, and it's important to understand John wrote those things, so the Christians... The true followers of Christ would realize it does matter what we do with our bodies, and we are not to sin. We are to obey the commands of Jesus. We are to follow him. We are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to love each other. And so he's really exposing the false teaching that has infiltrated them. Many of them even got to the point where they believed that the Spirit came on Jesus at his baptism and then left him before he was crucified. Because, you know, they could not imagine, they couldn't believe that God, how could God suffer? 
How could God die? How could God bleed? No, 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 no way. So they believed that it only seemed like Jesus was a real man. It was like a phantom. It was like some kind of theophany or something like that. He only appeared to be a real man in flesh and blood, but not really. There's no way God could be a man. And so you can see how this goes against Christianity. You know, that's why the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation, God becoming man, is so important because that's who Jesus is. And he became a man in order to save man. From his sin. He came for so much more, but that's part of why Jesus came. And so if you miss that, if you dismiss that, then how can you truly be a Christian? You know, John said in John 4, I mean, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except, no one comes to the Father except through me. So, that's what was going on. So, 1 John's not an ordinary letter. It doesn't begin like most letters in, in the New Testament begin. Uh, he just kind of jumps right in. It's probably indicative of the fact that they, they knew each other very well. They were very familiar with him. And so, this is the same John, likely, that wrote the Gospel of John. And 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. We won't get into all of that. Uh, there's a lot we, that could be said about the, the, the history and, and uh, the geography and all of that, but uh, if I go there, my wife and children will probably fuss at me when it's over. So let's go to the first four verses. That's all we're going to cover, okay? Four verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Where is that in your Bible? Yeah, that, that, those are the first words of the Bible. You open it up. You're going to start your January reading. <laughs> and you open it up to Genesis 1, verse 1, and that's what you're going to find. Then, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where is that in the Bible? The Gospel of John. There you go. So, the book of Genesis, in the beginning. The Gospel of John, in the beginning. Hey, what have we learned in our inductive Bible study? We look for stuff like that. Stuff like that jumps off the page. It gets our attention. And so we, we begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It helps us to understand what he's talking about. And now here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning. So we're seeing it again. Everybody see that? So who was in the beginning with God and was God that, that's referred to as the Word? Jesus. Jesus. We've already read this morning, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Does that sound like he's a man? Absolutely. The Word became flesh. Why does John write such a thing? Because all of these brilliant, talented, wise, influential people were spreading this false doctrine that he was not really a man. That's why he wrote it. Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we have seen his glory. So look at the NLT. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He's the word of life. This is the one who is life itself. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. 
And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. So, call on your inductive Bible study skills, look at these four verses, and tell me, do you see any repetition? Any repetition here? Sure. One of the first things that jumps off the page at me is two or three times he says, what we saw, we've seen, we have seen. Why would he say all of that? He said, we heard him, we saw him, we touched him, right? So, doesn't take a Philadelphia lawyer to figure out that we're talking about some, something physical and tangible. And they're saying Jesus is not that. Oh, yes, he is. John says, I saw him. I was with him. I touched him and I heard his voice yes he is a real man it's, it's like Becky and I visiting an old old sister some uh, Peggy would know her I don't even remember her name Years ago, before I ever lived in Louisiana, we were visiting her and she was telling us she I know what I know what I know. That's what John's doing. I know what I know what I know. And so, here's what you're going to see in 1 John. You're going to see four words that show up over and over and over. Okay? Truth. Life, love, and you're going to see communion, fellowship, that kind, those kinds of words, okay? So you're, we're going to see this over and over and over. We're going to see a lot of other things. We're going to see things like in 1 John 1, verse 7, in 1 John 4, verse 2, in chapter 2, verse 2, we're going to read things of where Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. He's our advocate with the Father. He shed his blood for our sins. All of those things. Why are all those things in there? Because he's dealing with the fact that these false teachers are telling them, we don't sin. Sin's nothing. Sin's in the body. The body is nothing. So since we don't have any sin, what do we need Jesus for? He, did, he didn't die for our sins because God doesn't care about our sins. It doesn't matter. We live in the Spirit. We are spiritual. So... What you find in 1 John is a lot of the gospel. You're going to see the gospel. And John says, this is something else I want you to think about in, in your inductive Bible study. A lot of contrasts. Life and death. Love and hate. Those kinds of things. You're going to see a lot of contrasts as you go through here. We're going to learn a lot about love. Chapter 4 is one of my most favorite chapters in all the Bible. We're going to get to spend a lot of time on the teaching of Jesus when it comes to loving one another. It matters how we live. It matters how we love. And I want us to stop for just a moment before I finish and just say, this Gnostic view of this separation of the spirit and the flesh 
has affected us probably in ways that we're not that familiar with. But yet it has affected the church. I want to read a couple of quotations uh, from N.T. Wright who addresses a lot of this. He says, instead of saving people from earth, in other words, from earth, not people who came from earth, but instead of saving people from earth, early Christians believed God was bringing heaven and earth together, making creation new. They believed that God would then raise his people from the dead to share in and indeed to share his stewardship over this rescued and renewed creation. And they believed all this because of Jesus. Christ's resurrection was the starting point of this great work of renewal. Jesus embodied in himself the perfect fusion of heaven and earth. Does everybody see that? You see how the incarnation, you see how God becoming man, Jesus leaving the glory of heaven, coming to the earth and the incarnation is a picture of what God is ultimately doing. He is bringing heaven and earth together. In the book of Revelation, you read about the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. All through the book of Exodus, we just finished the book of Exodus. How many times in our study of the book of Exodus did we talk about God wanting to dwell with his people? God coming to his people. And that's what God is doing through Jesus. From as early as the third century, some Christian teachers tried to blend this with types of the Platonic belief generating the idea of leaving earth and going to heaven, which became mainstream by the Middle Ages, but Jesus' first followers never went that route. You know, we used to hear sermons about going to heaven, the people talking about going to heaven, and yet somehow or another, and this is a weird thing to me, We believed in a resurrection of the body, but in a way we really didn't. Because the idea was we would go to heaven and nobody knew what they were going to do in heaven. Well, we're going to praise God. We're going to praise God. What's that mean? We're going to praise God in heaven. In this spiritual, ethereal place, it's non-physical, it's not material, nothing like that. It's not earth for sure. Uh, the earth is going to be burned up and everything in it. And so we, we take these verses here and there and we pick and choose and we believe in this difference between the spirit and the flesh. And we go to these verses in the Bible that seem to contrast the spirit and the flesh. And and we say, see there, it's all about the spirit. It's not about the flesh. The flesh is dying. The flesh is going to be dead in sin. And, And so we're basically teaching Greek philosophy when we do that. We are a whole person. We are a whole person. And that includes your spirit and your physical body. And we are going to have a new body. We're going to have a new body at the resurrection. And the Lord is coming down from heaven with all the saved of the ages, with all the disembodied saved spirits and their bodies, they're going to be joined with their resurrected bodies and we're going to live in the new creation in the Eden, in the garden of God with him forever and ever and ever. That's what awaits us. And what a beautiful, beautiful thing it's going to be. I'm not and you're not going to float around on some cloud and play a harp for jillions of years. 
and not quite sure where we're at. That's not what God's doing. So anyway, there are a lot of things in 1 John that are going to apply to our lives. I just wanted to throw that one out there. And um, I'm looking forward to this study. I think it'll be a really fun, interesting time as we go through 1 John. I hope that you'll be here for all of it. Get your journals, uh, take your notes, write in them, whatever your thoughts are, your observations, your interpretation, and the application that you see you can make in your life. All right. Thank you very much. Praise him. Come on up.